This is Redeemer, and uh, I'm not usually up here, but our fantastically anointed worship leader is out, so I'm filling in for a couple weeks, and uh, because I'm filling in, you guys get special preachers for the next two weeks, yahoo, and uh, we'll do that in a bit. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, for this beautiful season. We thank you that uh, this ugly virus is starting to uh, go away. The vaccines are working, our distancing is working or helping. Father, we just thank you that we are in the palm of your hand. Lord, I pray that everything we do today, worship, speaking, whether we're shaking hands or or punching fists at each other, that all of that would be done for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. All who are thirsty. Who are we? Come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the wave of your mercy. As deep cries out to
You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you.
filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. This chorus is the song that they sing in heaven because it's written in Revelation. So as we sing these, there could be angels saying, hey, I know that song. I think I'll sing along with them. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. chosen in your love and your holiness and your glory to pick us up out of the mire and make us your sons and daughters. Lord, we are so thankful. We couldn't have planned a better story. Father, we give you all the glory this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. as is our custom. I want to tell a children's story this morning. Um, thank you for letting me lead worship. It is so fun to do that. I mean, I get nervous all week long, and then I start doing worship, and I think, oh, God, this is all for you anyway. It was never about me, was it? So, hallelujah. Are you ready for a gilly-galley story? Yeah. Way to go. All right. Thank you, Chris. I'll pay you after. Um, once upon a time, there was a town called, and in Gopherville, there's a gopher named. Well, the school in Gopherville decided to try something new, softball. The kids were excited to learn softball because other schools were already playing it. Beaver Town had several teams already. At first, the gophers were not very good, but as time went on, they got better. The school had four teams, and they played each other after school. Gilly Galley's team was not the best one. He played in the outfield, and the other teams didn't hit it very hard, so he rarely got a chance to catch the ball. But they had a tournament at the end of the season, and there was a school champion team. It wasn't Gilly Gilly's team. When the champions got their trophy, there was a letter from Beavertown. The champion Beavertown 
team wanted to play the champion gopher team. Everyone thought the Beavers would win because they'd been playing softball for three years already, and the Gophers had just gotten started this year. But the challenge was accepted, and most of the town went to the softball field to watch the game. Mother and Silly Sally didn't want to go, so they stayed home with the twins. Father knew all the rules of softball, so he was very excited to go with Gilly Galley. They bought some popcorn and settled in for the game. I'll finish it next week. No, I'm just kidding. The teams were pretty evenly matched. The game went back and forth. The Gophers scored more runs in the beginning, but then the Beavers scored more runs later in the game. Finally, it was the ninth inning, and the Beavers were up to bat. They were losing by two runs, and their best hitter was up to bat. He got on base. Then their second best hitter got up to bat. A hit. The game was tied. Then their last hitter struck out, and the inning ended with a tie score. Gilly Galley was cheering for the Gophers. Father, what happens when the game ends in a tie? Well, they keep playing until someone wins. They will play a tenth inning to see who wins. Well, what if it's still tied after that inning? Then they'll play another inning. And that is what happened. Inning after inning, they kept playing, scoring, playing one another. It went on and on for a long time. And finally, Gilly Galley was getting tired and the sky was getting darker. Can we go home now, he asked. Father was really into the game now and wanted to see who won. Now, the Bible says that patience is the fourth fruit of the Spirit. Gilly Gally remembered that verse that listed all the fruit of the Spirit. He was memorized that list in several different translations of the Bible. In my old Bible, the fourth fruit is long-suffering. I think that may be a better translation for this game. Father, that was supposed to be a joke. You didn't get that, huh? There's no King James readers around here. Okay. Okay. Um, Father then remembered that the first fruit was love and decided he would take Gilly Galley home so he could go to sleep. When they got home, Mother was listening to the game on the radio. Father asked her, who won the game? Mother shrugged her shoulders. It's still going on. And then they all went to sleep. The end. Nope. Sorry. Um, hey, I am really pleased to introduce... Uh, Pastor Bill Anthes. Uh, Bill is, you, most of you know him, he pastored here, he pastored at Grace, he's just pastored everywhere. And uh, he is one of my mentors. He graciously meets with me once a month, and uh, I call him my spiritual director, that's a covenant thing. And uh, I'm really pleased, and I feel like I'm really growing from that relationship. So, please welcome Bill. Well, thank you, Pastor Bill Miller, and uh, the growth and the edification is mutual, my friend. I have been living with, to some degree of intensity or other, I've been living with Paul's letter to the Colossians for the better part of a year. I was supposed to teach a Sunday school class at Grace, and then COVID hit, so I and Colossians went on pause, but I've been sneaking back into it every chance I can get, and now we're finally trying to uh, have that Sunday school class at 12.15 in the afternoon. So you can imagine the attendance figures we're getting. But at any rate, um, I've come to appreciate this uh, relatively brief letter of the Apostle Paul in a new and deeper way. And it seems to me that Colossians makes a wonderful contribution to our overall understanding and appreciation of the so great a salvation that God has made available to us in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul insists in this letter that Christ is absolutely supreme over all creation and every created being within it, whether they're visible or invisible, because all things have been created in him and through him and for him, and he continues to hold it all together. He wrote that because there were some folks who had come into Colossae uh, teaching otherwise. So Paul is making sure that the believers stand firm in what they know to be true. At the same time, Paul also insists that the work of Jesus is completely sufficient to bring people into a right relationship with God and to keep them safe from the powers of evil. 
because again, there were people who were teaching he is not sufficient, you have to add something to his finished work. Paul says, oh no, you don't. And what we're going to be looking at this morning are two two-verse snippets that remind us of four words that begin with R that have to do with aspects of the so great a salvation that God has made available to us in and through Christ. And the first little snippet is chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul is actually, in the previous verse, finishing up telling them what he's praying on their behalf. And he says this in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light for, notice he's going to explain in verse 13 something about what he just said in verse 12, for he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us or relocated us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We'll get to the second two verses in a while. One commentator calls verses 13 and 14 a concise summary of the gospel. I really like that. And I remembered hearing and reading that in merry old England, when knights jousted and men wore tights, they were, they were translating the Greek New Testament into English. And they ran across the Greek word euangelion. And they decided to translate with the word gospel. And at that time, the word gospel meant the good, glad, merry news that makes a man fairly leap with joy. And I hope by the time we get done looking at this concise summary of the gospel, I see a couple of you folks leaping for joy as well. So first he says, for he has rescued us. Now when we hear the word rescue, there's a situation implied, isn't there? It means that somebody or somebodies are in some kind of really bad trouble. They're helpless to run away from it. They're not strong enough to fight against it. They need intervention if they're going to be anything other than just toast. We're familiar with rescue operations, are we not? A number of years back, there were those miners in Chile that had to spend all kinds of time down there until extraordinary measures were taken to extract them from the deadly peril that they were facing. Just a couple of years ago, there was that soccer team of those young boys. They were exploring caves in Thailand until the water rose, and they were doomed until a whole bunch of people got together and went after them to bring them out safely. So rescue means somebody is in bad shape, dire straits, and unless somebody else comes in to rescue or get them out of that, they will not survive it. And so the question becomes, from what do we need to be rescued according to the New Testament? We'll start with that, which is a really good place to begin. And in uh, Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul is kind of giving his usual greeting, and he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might rescue us out of this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. We need to be rescued out of the age that is in rebellion against God and which is ruled over by the powers of darkness. And Jesus gave himself to do precisely that. At the end of chapter 1 in 1 Thessalonians, Paul the Apostle again writes, For they themselves report about us, what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. The present evil age will experience coming wrath. Jesus came to earth to rescue us from having to experience that. If anybody wants to leap for joy at this point, that's okay. But there's more. 
because in Colossians chapter 1, he rescues us from the dominion of darkness, the text says. Now, the word translated dominion here is usually translated authority. We have been rescued from the authority of darkness. We were existing in a situation in which separation from God, evil powers, and the evil one ran the show. We needed to be rescued from that. Ephesians chapter 6 uses this terminology. It calls it the world forces of this darkness. In other words, guys, we were in deep trouble. But God came to the rescue in our Lord Jesus Christ to get us out of it and to bring us into a much better situation. So here comes the second R. We have been relocated, or the, Bible, uh, the, the translation says, transferred from that horrible situation into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Out of darkness into light. Out of death into life because our Lord Jesus has come. You know what it is to be relocated or transferred from one place to another, don't you? Yeah, Enid and I were transferred from New Jersey by Sunbeam Appliance Company many moons ago. And so we were transferred from New Jersey and we were brought into this wonderful realm of New York State. We were taken out from under the authority of the governor of New Jersey and placed under the benevolent authority of, I think it was Mario Cuomo at the time. It's an issue of authority. So Jesus, in accordance with the will of God the Father, rescued us from the authority of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom or the realm of rulership or the authority of the Son of His love, His beloved Son, our Lord Jesus. From darkness to light, from the authority of Satan to God. Whenever I hear terminology like that, I remember from the Acts of the Apostles a situation in which Paul is making his third defense and he's doing it in front of kings and all sorts of high mucky mucks. And he's recounting not only his meeting with Jesus, but the commission that Jesus gave him. And that drove him for the rest of his life. And here's part of what Jesus said to Paul. He said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And here's what you're going to do, Paul. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. That was Paul's mission, and that is what was accomplished at the cross, and he went about declaring that so that people could be rescued from and transferred to. The next one is redemption. It says, in union with Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you see the word redemption, it has to do with setting someone free by the payment of a price. In fact, the heart of that word is translated ransom elsewhere in the New Testament. You remember what Jesus said, the Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom, a ransom for the many, a reference, obviously, to the cross. In the days that Paul was writing and living and writing to the Colossians, a ransom, or I'm sorry, redemption might be used in the following situations. Two armies go to war. One army wins. They take a whole bunch of captives. The peons they sell as slaves. But the general types, they hold captive for ransom. And they say, if you give us a lot of money, we will set this person free. And depending on whether people thought the general was worth it or not, that's what happened. But they were in bondage, in chains sometimes, until the ransom price was paid, and then they were set free. Also, a slave, if they were able to save up enough resources, could buy themselves, 
could, could purchase their own freedom by paying that price to their master and allegedly to a god. So it means to set free through the payment of a price. In our case, and in the case of everyone, because of our sins, we were not at all free. In fact, we were in bondage. We were in that present evil age. We were under the dominion of darkness. But because Jesus paid the price of our freedom on the cross, you and I now can be said to have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. It is one of the wonderful gospel words. And because the price was paid, and we have been forgiven of our sins and set free from the authority of darkness, it, that is the authority of darkness, has absolutely no right to tell us what to do at all, and it has no right to scare us one whit. We're out from under it, and we're in the kingdom of God's Son, forgiven of our sins, redeemed. Ephesians chapter 1, which has a lot of connections to Colossians, you may know that, it says in chapter 1, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. There, there's an explicit connection between our freedom and the blood that Jesus shed on the cross as the sacrifice for our sins. So that's three R's, guys, that are components of the so great a salvation, which is ours by the grace of God and the work of Jesus. If we go over to chapter 1, verses 21 and 2, we're going to run into the fourth R. Paul writes, And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death to present you before him holy blameless, and beyond reproach. We have been reconciled. That's probably the word that we're most familiar with out of everything I've mentioned so far today. How many of us have seen close relationships go haywire and people become alienated from one another and you know the pain and the grief that can be caused by it. But perhaps we also know the joy that can take place when that uh, alienation is addressed and two people are reconciled. To be reconciled means to put back a relationship, to make it whole and right the way that it should be. Well, because of our um, sinfulness, we were on the outs with God. But through the death of his son, we have now been reconciled to him. The relationship has been made whole. That is the fourth R word. The cross, therefore, not only bought our freedom and the forgiveness of our sins, but also accomplished reconciliation with God, a healing, a restoration of the relationship. This idea of reconciliation occurs a couple of times in the New Testament. Uh, Ephesians 2 speaks of it. 2 Corinthians 5 speaks of it, but Romans 5 speaks of it as well. And I just wanted to direct our attention there because it is so powerful. Paul writes in verse 8, a verse that maybe is the favorite for some of you. It says, for, um, but while we were still sinners, God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. There's that idea again. Verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. In terms of these four aspects of our salvation, they were conceived in the loving heart of God. They were achieved at the cross and in the resurrection of Christ. 
and they may now be received by anyone who is helpless and honest enough to say, I need what you did. I trust you. I take this as mine, and I'm going to do a little gospel jig <laughs> in response. Rescued, you have been. Transferred, you now are. Redeemed, sins forgiven. The powers of darkness have no authority in your life anymore because what gave them any authority has been dealt with at the cross. Reconciled to God. This is the gospel, guys, or at least a good summary of it. And I, I really do think that it is good, glad, merry news that can make a man or a woman leap for joy. May I pray? Father, we thank you for the chance to look at this summary of the gospel. We know it's not everything, but it sure is the heart of it. And so my prayer, Father, is that we would come to, by the Spirit's teaching, a deeper appreciation for the sufficiency of the work of Jesus. Come to realize that there really is no condemnation, that darkness has no authority over us, that we have been reconciled to you. We are yours now and forever. And at the end, we will be presented before you, Father, as mind-blowing as this is, holy blameless, and beyond reproach. Thank you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Um, we don't usually end this early, so I'll just preach another message. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. Hey, if you, uh, f if you feel strong today, some of us are going uh, to drive to a place that is selling this kind of pretty display case that we want to put in our narthex area. Um, we could use some extra hands and arms and backs if you got one. Um, just stop and talk to me after the service if you can. We're just going to go get it right as soon as we get done chatting with each other. Uh, either talk to me, talk to John. Cosma, and uh, we could really use the help. We do have a bunch of Panera Bread stuff out in the fellowship hall, out the door and to the right. Feel free to go and grab whatever you can eat. And um, we will see you next week. God bless. <laughs>